Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry that there's not too much room here. You know, there's a crowd, large crowd that we have, so please find a seat. Help yourself. But it's so nice to see uh, the youth here and, and, and young uh, children running around. It, it makes the congregation alive. Lord, we come to you again to thank you for who you are. You are the God that deserves worship. We just we can't fathom how much your greatness, your holiness, and your love is, Lord. But help us grow more and more each day to know you. And we ask that you guide us again as you have been during the worships uh, singing and 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 now as we study your uh, as we bring as you bring the message today lord i ask that you guide me as the vessel to be able to bring out a message that all of us can learn from and to be molded and to be strengthened because all power and goodness comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, if you're looking for a title for our message today, I titled it, The Body of Faith. And you're probably saying, well, where's he coming from here? But yes, we're covering uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, verse 6 to 13, but before we get to that, I think it's best to give uh, a background to, to what Paul is talking about here to the Thessalonians. That way, you know, we're not uh, brought into the middle of a story, not understanding the whole picture. So, to give a bit of a background, actually, uh, the book of Acts, Luke uh, covers uh, some background to this. And it starts actually where Paul went to Philippi, that's in Acts chapter 16, and basically uh, preached the gospel there. And the interesting part of this is everywhere that Paul went to preach the gospel of good news, there was opposition. And, and in fact, in Philippi, he, him and uh, Silas ended up in prison. They were scourged, actually. They were beaten up and brought in prison. Isn't that ironic? You know, here you are, you bring good news and you end up in prison. They beat you up. So, uh, all of us, let's go out there and preach the good news. And so, from there, they went, you know, to Amphipolis and then they ended up in uh, Thessalonica. Thessalonica at that time was the... Uh, the capital, actually, of uh, Macedonia. And it's, it's a wealthy city, a Greek city. And, uh, you know, the Greeks, they have so many gods. And so they ended up there, and the first thing they did was uh, preached where? In the synagogue. You know, they... What happened to them in Philippi, we have to remember, what happened to them in Philippi was they preached in the synagogue, they, and then uh, they cured a, a seer girl, and then they were beaten up. So they went to Thessalonica, and the first thing they do is they go to the synagogue <laughs> again to preach there. And uh, in that synagogue, uh, there were a lot of what you call the Gentile mm, God-fearers. They, they were not actually baptized as, as, as into the Judaism religion, but they are 
God-fearing, that they are interested in the religion of the Jews. And so there were a bunch of them there. And so here was Paul preaching the message. Basically, what was the message? Really, what is the gospel that Paul was preaching? And it's still the, the gospel um, uh, that is good today. What in the nutshell was the gospel that he was preaching? This gospel, in a nutshell, is saying that unless you have, unless you are in Christ, you are doomed. This is the gospel that, that Paul was preaching. And the result was a lot of the Gentiles that were there in that synagogue believed. And a few Jews believed. And again, as usual, the Jews got jealous and they caused a riot once again which drove, you know, they, they tried to basically drive away Paul. What, what, what Paul did in, in Thessalonica was just he preached there just like three Sabbaths. That's it. Three Sabbaths. Not, not, not necessarily uh, three weeks. We, we don't know if, if he did it in three consecutive Saturdays. But uh, he preached three times there and then he was driven out. They actually, uh, they actually captured one of the disciples there, that, or the one that believed, the one of the members of the synagogue, and uh, what's, his name was Jason, and they, they, they captured him while, and while he was captured, uh, Paul went away. They, they sent Paul away uh, and he finally ended up in Athens. So basically the background was Paul was only there according to uh, these experts in, in history the maybe a, a maximum of maybe three months. So this is the background here of this letter to the Thessalonica that, that Paul was only has only spent about three months in that area. But the interesting thing is that Thessalonica, the church there that he, he founded, was known for their faith. Was known for their faith. Because if we go there uh, in first. Thessalonians, I think uh, we covered this maybe in our Bible studies. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, it says here, uh, this was uh, Paul commending the church in, in Thessalonica, where, wherein he was only there for three months or maximum. He didn't stay there that long. But here in verse 8, he says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia, and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. Just that small time that Paul was there, the faith of the, 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 the believers there that Paul preached to spread all the way to Macedonia, Achaia, and every place. So if any one of us are thinking that maybe our faith is not that strong because we haven't been in the church that long. Here it shows that with the power of the Holy Spirit through preaching, and if you receive it and you accept it and, and be influenced by the power of that spirit, your faith will be contagious. It's a faith that is contagious. Here is a, is a, is a body of believers 
that's not even, which Paul did not even spend too much time on, and here they are. There's, their faith is being spread all over the place. That when Paul was in Athens, he even heard about it. Verse 9, for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serving a living and true God. See, we have to remember, these are Greeks. These are Greeks that have, that have so many gods. And they abandoned all that belief to believe in the gospel and to stay with that gospel. Verse 10 here in, in Romans, in 1 Thessalonians 1, it says, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. See? Remember I told you his main message is, unless you have, unless you are in Christ Jesus, you are doomed. How many of us are bold enough to go out there and preach that gospel today, even today? You think they will readily accept us? If you say, unless you have Christ, you are doomed. That is the gospel. I know that today uh, the, the tendency is to make the gospel palatable and not to offend people. But brethren, you know, we have to remember that Jesus Christ is the rock of offense. You know, 1 Peter 2 verse 8 says that. Romans 9 verse 30 to 33. A stumbling block that will derail people's beliefs. And it will offend. The gospel offends. I know it. Because I was offended when I first heard that unless you are in Christ, you are doomed. And I, the first thing I said was, whoa, that's so presumptuous. You're exclusivist. You know, that's the, that doesn't sit well in today's, you know, accept every religion mentality. But that was even the, the mentality back then in Greece. And this was what the, the ones that held to, to Paul's preaching did. And their faith spread throughout the area. So with that background, we now go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9, verse 6, I mean verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, so what happened was they from Thessalonica, they went to Berea, uh, Paul and Silas, and then somehow Timothy uh, went back to, to uh, Thessalonica to help, out, help the people there more. And then eventually, Timothy joined uh, Paul. And I believe when this was written, they were already in, in, in Corinth. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kind of, kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. Here was Paul writing to the Thessalonians. In verse 7 he says, For this reason, brethren, in all of our distresses and affliction, we are comforted about, your, about you through your faith. Did we catch that? Here was Paul writing to the Thessalonians. Paul, the chosen apostle, the great apostle, telling the Thessalonians 
For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. That should point, that jumped right to me and says, wow. I always thought that faith was between me and God. My faith in God will deliver me. It is my salvation. But brethren, here it's showing faith. The faith of the Thess Thessalonians is not only their personal, private belief or something that matters only within their circle. It also belongs to the apostles and the rest of the church as well. The health of one's congregation's faith matters for others. That's why it entitled this the body of faith. Faith that is exercised affects everybody else. It's not just a personal thing that we have with God. Now what faith am I talking about here? Faith that is a belief, right? A faith that is being faithful. That means staying with it. And what belief is this? Belief in the gospel. Belief in Jesus Christ. That kind of faith. But notice in verse 8. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Why is he saying this? Because let's face it. If, if you really strive to or yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and, and allow yourself to, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. Back then, the persecution was physical. They drive you away and, uh, and they, they beat you up. Uh, and they do all sorts of things. What about today? Do they persecute us that way? Maybe in some areas of the world. But what about here in the United States? What form of persecution will you get? You know, the enemy, he, he, is, a, he is a wise enemy. He learns from, from experience. He tried physical persecution, and that didn't work for him. So now, he seems to be trying a different method. He says, especially here in the US, I'm going to lavish you with material things. I'm going to lavish you with things that titillate the senses that will satisfy the appetite of the lusts of your flesh. I am going to flood you with these things. I'm going to persecute you with entertainment so that you will become complacent. Now, I think that's a more subtle and dangerous and harder way of persecution. Because when everything seems to be going well and, and you know, you're the material things that titillate the here and now and make you feel good. And it, do, it doesn't seem to be wrong. But the thing is, you've become complacent with holding on to the gospel, which is being in Jesus Christ. We have to remember, we have to simplify what the gospel is. The gospel is humanity is doomed, but God in his love made a way 
for humanity to be saved. And that is to be in Christ. Unless you have Jesus Christ, you are doomed. And it seems harsh, but that is in a nutshell what it is. And in today's society, that, that may not sit well because today's society is all comfort and ease and oneness and unity, which is not a bad thing in itself. In the right context, in the right context, the enemy has effective, you know, he has effectively created an environment of materialism, physical senses. It fosters complacency to spiritual matters. See? And that's why the Thessalonians' faith spread, because their object of faith was Jesus. We ask ourselves, who is our object of faith? Is it our talents? Is it our wealth, material things? You know, in today's society, the, 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 at least here in the US it seems, is that all religions lead to God nowadays. I mean, I was just, uh, here's, a, here's an excerpt from a book uh, by Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle in his book, The Power of Now, just to give you an excerpt, he says uh, from the book, The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment. It says, all spiritual teachings originate from the same source. In that sense, there is and always has been only one master who manifests in many different forms. He concludes that all spiritual teachings originate from the same source. Once they become verbalized and written down, they are obviously no more than collection of words. He's, what he's basically saying is, you can go to any belief you, can, you want. You can, you can uh, espouse any teaching, spiritual teaching there is out there because there's only one source. If you believe in Jesus, that's fine. If you believe in so-and-so, that's fine because God is the source of everything. Notice how that is contrary to Paul's teaching to what the Thessalonians believed. That unless you are in Christ, you are doomed. Try to bring that out there to a world that believes that all spiritual te teachings or originate from the same source. Notice the contrast. So the object of faith is Jesus Christ. And faith is not a personal, well, it is a personal thing, but it's not just a personal thing between us and God. It's not just a vertical thing between us and God. It's also a, a horizontal. Paul was, was uh, encouraged by the faith of the Thessalonians. So our faith, the way we exercise our faith, affects the body, affects the, the body. We now go back to uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what, thanks we, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? And here it is again. It says in verse 10, as we, as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and that we may complete what is lacking in your faith. So here Paul is saying we can also influence you with, with our faith. It's inter, it's a mutual give and take. 
that it's not just a, you know, we're so accustomed in today's society where it's me, me, my, my personal rights, mine, my salvation, my faith. Here it says it's the body. Your faith affects the entire body. For all the joy which we rejoice, uh, verse 10, that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. In verse 11, now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Verse 12, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you. See, if we have this understanding that faith involves everyone and it's interconnected it also fosters love among the brethren it results in love and what does it do as well in verse 13 he he uh, indicates that Verse 13, it says, So that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. See, this faith ties into the Advent. He reminded them what caused them to, to hang on. What caused the Thessalonians to hang on? The belief in Jesus Christ and the belief that he is returning again. The belief that he is returning again. See, a few weeks, the past few weeks, you know, in, the, in these times of, of COVID, I mean, funerals are kind of common. And we've been to a few uh, lately. And somehow, I've it left an impression to me that when someone dies, like their, their body is buried and, and then the spirit goes to heaven and then that's the end of it. But we have to realize that, you know, the Bible says that's not the case. There is a separation of the body and the spirit momentarily but the final uh, result of eternal life is Jesus Christ is returning and the disembodied spirit will reunite with the same body that died and it will be resurrected in glorified form and perfected. And that's the, the final state of those that are saved. Eternal life. It's not like, uh, okay, to, you die today, and then, okay, we bury your body, and then now you go to heaven up there, disembodied spirit floating up there somewhere. I mean, I, I, all the way to the book of Revelation, it says that he is, Jesus Christ is going to return with the, the, those that are in him, and they will be reunited with their bodies that are resurrected in glorified form. So that the final state will not be a disembodied spirit. It's united to the body that's glorified. That's, that's uh, with all the, uh, the imperfections corrected. Would you rather live that way? Or would you rather end up spiritually disembodied floating up there in the heavenly realms where we don't know? But it's in the Bible. And it says, so that you may establish your hearts, in verse 13, unblameable in holiness before our Lord and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus and all his saints. Remember, Jesus has already resurrected when, when he said this and went up to heaven. And he says, Jesus is coming back. I, I, I think we forget this aspect. I think we, 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 most of the, maybe it's just how I heard it, maybe I understood it wrong, but that's how I got it, that when people die, okay, now he is home. 
you know, he is home with, with, with Jesus in heaven. And that's it. No, that's not it. When Jesus returns, those that, are, the, the, those that died in him are coming back with him. And they will be reunited with their bodies. And they will be like Jesus Christ. See, when Jesus Christ died, what happened? Did his body stay here and rot and then the spirit went up to heaven? No. The whole body resurrected, glorified. And it's going to be the same with those that are in Christ at his second coming. And that is also part of the message. But unless you are in Christ, you are doomed. You won't be one of those that will be resurrected, glorified. Spirit and body joined together. Spirit and body joined together. So I hope we realize that even though this is a small passage, even though the church in Thessalonica, which only, they were only with Paul for, yeah, a maximum of, let's say, three months. That faith in there, they, they allowed it to burn within them. And they allowed it to be exercised through persecution. And they stayed on. It doesn't take years to do this, brethren. Preaching of the word, they, they, the Holy Spirit went in through preaching, and with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, they have that faith, the gift of faith. And with them allowing it to work in them through uh, persecution, that faith was exercised, and it even encouraged the great apostle Paul. And because of this, the letter was written, and now we understand that faith is not a, just a personal thing between me and God. It is a body. It, it involves the entire body of Christ. Didn't Jesus Christ say, I am the vine, you are the branches? Faith works that way. It all ties in. We are all interconnected, tied in. To Jesus Christ, the reason for our faith, the reason for our hope, the reason why we endure persecution. Don't, you know, let's not uh, lose sight of the fact that even though we, li we live in, in a peaceful uh, society here, that persecution is not happening spiritually that it's it, it's bombarding us with with even a, a harder form of persecution i believe i will bombard you with ease and 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 comfort and and you know uh, things that make you feel good so that you can be complacent so that you don't have to you don't have to uh to go to church or, or fellowship because the enemy knows that if you if you just delude yourself into saying well, you know I have faith between me and God I will go to heaven my faith is this way I don't need to fellowship uh, brethren we have to go back to what the writer of Hebrews is saying here in Hebrews 10 verse 21 to 25 and I think I'm going to end with, with this one. It says here in Hebrews 10, verse 21 to 25, it says, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clear, clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds by doing your bible study on your own and just concentrate and growing in knowledge 
Is that what it says here in verse 25? It says here, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is that? The day of the return of Jesus Christ. The day that whoever, if we're still alive at that day, the, your body will be glorified with your spirit. Or for those that are dead in Christ, the disembodied spirit will join with the body that died and will be raised in a glorified form. And that is the message of the advent, the second advent of Jesus Christ. And it has something to do with faith that is shared and uh, that is working among the body of Jesus Christ. Let us not forsake our assembling together in any form. Because we are, if we are in Jesus Christ, we should long to be together. We should long to be together. If you are part of the, the branches, or, you know, he's the vine, we are the branches, don't you long, don't you miss the brethren? So let's, let's uh, put our hope and, and our reason for existence in, in this uh, from what we learned today. Brethren, amen.